the website. Good evening, everyone. We're continuing the series of Pirkei Avot. Today it's the third session. If you missed the first two, you can go into the website and find it there. Uh, we finished last time with the uh, eight Mishnah speaking about lawyers. I explained uh, uh, Jews that wants to become attorneys, criminal lawyers. We spoke about this because the Mishnah is speaking about uh, how, how basically a kosher trial has to go according to the Torah. And uh, we will continue today with the ninth Mishnah. So the Mishnah warns that if you deal with witnesses, you have to be very careful how you speak to them, because sometimes by the way you speak to them, they learn from you how to lie, or what to say, what not to say. Like sometimes you see in court here, the judge say, in, especially in ten, landlord tenants, he says to the landlord, I think that uh, if, we, if you waive uh, the money that the tenant owe you, then maybe uh, we can finish it faster. Uh, if you insist, no problem, but I cannot uh, tell you I'm not responsible for what can happen. Like he hint to you, give up the money. If you want the tenant out today, you better give up the money. He's already telling you, because if not, I'm going to give him another six-month extension or something. He's already hinting to you, leaving you no choice. That's not a fair trial. Justice, it's the opposite. The best testimony is when the witnesses are speaking, not knowing they're actually testifying. It's called Masiach Lefi Tumo. Did you ever hear this expression? Masiach Lefi Tumo means innocently a person speaks. Like they say in a, in a court here, everything you will say will be used against you in a court of law. Why? Right? That's the best testimony. When they catch him, He's mumbling, he's saying all kinds of things, everything is recorded. Later, of course, he's going to say, I didn't mean it, I was under pressure, baloney. But once he's saying something, that's the best testimony, because that's the truth. Later, the lawyer already told him what to say, what not to say. This is where we finished last week, we will move on. So the tenth Mishnah of this Perek, and we're finishing it soon, is, we spoke about Shmaya and Aftalion, two converts that were among the foundation of the transfer of the Torah. You know, there were the rabbis of Hillel Azaken, which later became the president of the Sanhedrin. And Hillel, the Chachamim writes in the Gemara that he had 80 students. The biggest one was Yonatan ben Uziel. When he was learning Torah, every bird that was flying above the place where he was learning Torah would burn to death and fall on the floor. That's how holy he was, Yonatan ben Uziel. And the youngest one, which means the last one than the least from the 80 student was Yohanan ben Zakai, which was the president of Israel in the destruction of the Second Temple when the Romans came to Israel after three years that they ambushed Jerusalem and they destroyed the Second Temple. Who was the president of that time? Yohanan ben Zakai. And the Gemara tells us that he was able to understand the birds able to understand the trees, able to understand the rivers, the angels, everything. That's how great he was. And thanks to him, the Romans didn't touch the family of Rabban Gamliel, because Mashiach has to come from this family, it's the, fam it's the family of David Amelech. And thanks to him, they didn't touch Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin moved from Jerusalem to Yavne. 71 chief rabbis of the world were sitting in Sanhedrin. Usually it's always in Bet HaMikdash. There's a special room, it's called Lishkat HaGazit. But they moved out of there because they saw that now there are too many cases in the court that we have to execute Jews because of the sins that they do. So they didn't want to kill anybody, so they moved out of Jerusalem. What's the connection? Because the Torah says, Hashem told the judges, from my altar, you take him directly to die, which, him, which means if they have to stone someone to death, they have to take him to a special hill, and from there they push him down, and then later they stone him. If he didn't die from falling, that's where they used to stone people. But the Torah, the Gemara also tells us that once every 70 years only they execute a person. 
it was more or less to make everybody get scared that this is possible. But really, they did everything they can not to execute everyone because they knew Hashem is in the end takes care of everyone and gives him exactly what he deserves. So they were not anxious to kill. It's once every seven years, and that's called already a cruel court. If they kill one person every seven years, they did everything they can. Now, what does it mean they did everything? They have to do what the justice says, right? Justice is justice. If you have to kill two people in one day, you have to kill them, because that's what the Torah said. The, the way they were avoiding it is by investigating the witnesses in two different rooms, and the investigation took place longer and longer and longer until they find a contradiction between what they said. If one witness say, I saw him uh, murdering another person in this place at that time under that tree. So they, say, they ask the other person, they say, yeah, same time, same place, same street, under the tree. So they say, what kind of tree? They say, it was fig trees, tree with figs. So then they ask, what was the size of the figs? What does it have to do with the murder? It's an irrelevant question. On purpose. And the one says, the figs were very big. And the other one says, I think it was a small size. Oh, contradiction. Very good. Go home. Goodbye. I send him home. Why? Knowing that Hashem in the end pays everyone what he deserves, we're not making them so anxious to execute people. But when they saw that there's, no, there's too many cases, another case and another case, so they decided to move to Yavne. Why to Yavne? Because Yavne, there's no altar. It's not Jerusalem. There's no holy temple in Yavne. So the Torah says you have to take him directly from the altar. Why the altar? Because the Lishkat Gazit was right next to the Mizbeach, to the altar. So once they, they reached the verdict, from there they had to take him right away, not to wait a second. Now since they're not sitting in Jerusalem, they cannot execute anybody. Found a very nice trick. So when the Romans came, they wanted to kill everyone. So he told them, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai, don't touch this yeshiva in Yavne. And he said, okay, no problem. We're not going to touch them. And there was one tzaddik, Rabbi Tzadok, that was fasting every day until his stomach became like a piece of paper. So he told them, don't touch Rabbi Tzadok. So they thought, this rabbi is his friend. No, let's not touch him. And, they, and he says, don't touch this yeshiva. I said, okay, maybe this is his yeshiva. We won't touch them. And he said, don't touch this family. I said, no problem. And this is Rabban Yohanan ben Zakai, which, which was the, the smallest student out of 80 students of Hillel Zaken. And Hillel Zaken was a student of these two converts, Shmaya and Naftalion. And they were the ones who transferred the Torah. The Rambam writes the entire list from Moshe Rabbeinu until the time of the Knesset Agdola, who were in charge of the Torah to transfer it from generation to generation. And those two, Shmaya and Naftalion, were two main ones. So the Mishnah starts, Mishnah Yud in chapter 1. The Mishnah says, Shmaya and Naftalion kiblu mehem. They received it from them. And Shmaya says, this is what Shmaya says, a person has to do everything he can that besides his Torah learning, which is an obligation morning and night around the clock to learn all the time, to, to find yourself a, a job that will produce to you some kind of income. So that means you can tutor kids, you can be a mohel, you can write mezuzot, uh, you know, you can be, uh, in the world of the Torah, you can be a, a butcher, slaughtering animals, you can be many things that in the Torah world you need. You need people. You need people who make tefillin. This is a job. You need uh, doctors. You need teachers. You need so many things, right? But try not to make the Torah a way of parnasa for you. That you go to become a rabbi because you want to be, uh, make parnasa from the Torah. No. You need to live, obviously. You have kids. The Torah will bring you the parnasa. Don't worry. But don't make it... I'm like some people go to college. Why you go to college? I want to have a degree. Why you want to have a degree? I want to be a lawyer. I want to be a doctor. I want to be an architect. What for? You love being? You like to go to court and stand there all day and fight and argue? No. I want to make a lot of money. That's why I dedicate so many years to go and learn. 99% of the people, if they tell them before they go to college, you're not going to make a salary. No money. 
Do you think anybody will go to college? You wouldn't have three students in every college. Three idiots. <laughs> that come. Why are you coming? I like to learn the law, you know, of the Constitution. It's very, I find it very interesting. It's not realistic. So, to make it the only reason why I go, no. So it's very interesting because once somebody told me that there's a secret here. Eovet HaMelacha, Usnet HaRabanut, Numeric value, Amelacha, it's Badatz, Gimatria Badatz, the Ashgacha of the Kashrut. In Israel, you have two Ashgachot. You have the Ashgacha of the Rabanut, the main Rabanut of every city, and you have the Badatz, which is very, very strict. Very, very strict, fanatic. They check everything, they surprise them, they come in the middle of the night, they open the freezer. <laughs> you cannot play games. They don't, if the owner is not kosher, they take away the key from him. You cannot open your own business. We don't trust you. You want ashgacha? We are the boss here when it comes to the food. You can take the money. It's your money. Anything else we do. We check what you buy, where you buy. We can tell you don't buy this ingredient, don't buy that ingredient. That's what they do. The Rabbanut is much more lenient. Not, I don't say that it's not good, especially me, because I don't know exactly all the ashgachot in Israel. We live here in America, but in general, it's well known that the Badat is very strict. So it's interesting, because Eovet HaMelacha, it's numeric value, Badat. Love the Badat. Usnet HaRabanut, stay away from the Ashgacha of the Rabanut, which you don't know always that it's 100%. Why? Not that they don't supervise. Of course, they come, they check. But they're not, they're not as strict. They're not as strict as the Badat. Uh, you know... Now in Israel, speaking about it, the secular Jews decided to fight against the religious people a new war. There's many different wars. There's wars in Pesach, if you're allowed to, eat, to sell chametz or not. The religious people use their political power to avoid selling chametz. But they want to eat chametz, they want to drink beer in restaurants, in the bars, they're not religious. So they fight against that every year, the same arguments. They also argue about the public transportation in Shabbat, if, we, if you should be or shouldn't be. They want to make Israel like Paris, like a regular going country. But the religious people always argue with them, and they use their political power to force them to keep some of the laws of the Torah, even though they are not interested. So now there's a new war now. Every time the religious people find that the company is violating the rules of Shabbat, they take away their ashgacha the supervision. No, they lost their certificate. What's the connection to the food? No connection. The food is kosher. But since they're not keeping Shabbat, we cannot rely on you. If you don't keep Shabbat, you're wicked. A wicked person, I cannot trust you to feed me kosher food because you don't even care about your own soul. For sure you don't care about mine. Because of that, I take away your ashgacha. This is the way it is. Now they found a way. Let's do the same thing to the religious people. They're very upset with the rabbis in the, on, on charge of the badat. So now they made a cherem. It's called cherem in Israel. They bind products that have the ashgacha of the badat. So the, the, the secular Jews that eat kosher, we are, we're not talking those who don't eat kosher, then they don't eat ashgacha at all. Those who wants to eat kosher, they only buy now rabbanut on purpose. If they see badats, they don't buy. What's, the, what, what's this cherem? It makes them very weak. Why it makes them very weak? Because let's see if I open the factory for food. Until now, to make a lot more business, I must get the badats. Because all the ultra-orthodox, which is tens of thousands of people, will never touch my product until they have the, the stamp of the badats. Now, the badats bring me the religious people, but make me lose the other people. So it's not so good for business. So that's going to bury them, that's what they say, and so far they get a lot of people. The one thing that they don't know is, and we have to understand what it, what it is, Ashgacha, kosher food, has to stay out of politics. Politics, every day you're going to have arguments about politics, it will never end. There was always politics, there was always be until Mashiach come. But even a person who hates these rabbis, he claims that they're prejudiced, he claims whatever he wants to claim. Even he should only eat the Rashgacha. Why? 
It's not about if I like you, you're my enemy or you're my body. That's not how it goes. Same thing doctors. I can be an enemy of the best doctor, the best brain surgeon. But God forbid, if my dear uh, relative needs a brain surgery, who should I recommend him to go to? To my biggest enemy. Why? He's the best doctor in this field. What does it have to do now, my relationship with him? You want to save the boy or not? Same thing, Kashrut. You hate them, you're entitled to, maybe they do things wrong, maybe there are, uh, their politics is ugly, maybe they do things that you hate, no problem. Maybe they didn't accept your kids to the school because they're Sfaradim. There's a lot of, excuse my language, a lot of garbage behind the scenes. But the bottom line is, do they do the proper job in supervising the food? The answer is yes. So far it was never proven otherwise. They're very strict. So when it comes to eat kosher food, it's better for your soul. You know, in the time of the Rambam, a one city full of people, they send a letter to the Rambam asking him to prove that there, w there will be the resurrection of the dead and Olam Abba and all these famous questions that we all have. Life after life, you know, heaven, all these things that we ask. So, you know, the Chazal, the Negmara, they spoke about it in many different places. They say what the righteous people going to get after, in the afterlife, what the wicked people is going to get, what does it mean days of Mashiach, what's going to be after, what's, what does it mean the resurrection of the death of the exiles, the resurrection of the death in Israel. They spoke about it. The Talmud is in different places speaking about it. So... After all they read in the Torah, in the Talmud, they still send a letter to the Rambam, we want you to prove to us, this is religious people, this is 900 years ago almost, 900 years ago. Religious people from a, from a religious town sending the Rambam, Maimonides, a letter, prove to us about those things. So the Rambam answered them, you, you, you're not going to believe this, it's amazing. The Rambam sends them a letter back. The Rambam says, when a person eats not kosher food, listen to the question and listen to the answers. The question was, proof to us there was going to be the resurrection of the dead and life after life and all these things and heaven and all these things that Chazal spoke about. And the Rambam says, uh, when a per this is his answer. When a person eats non-kosher food, the, f the food turns into blood. This is word by word his answer. It turns into blood. Which means you take a physical thing, which is food, physical, everybody knows it's material, and it turns into blood. The Torah said, Adam wa nefesh. Blood, it's a spiritual thing. It's half and half. Food, supposedly, it's 100% physical. Soul, soul, it's 100% spiritual. God is 100% spiritual. The blood is like half and half. It's half physical, but it's also half spiritual. Where does it say? Because the Torah says you're not allowed to eat the blood. Ki adam wa nefesh. Because the blood is the nefesh. It's the lowest part of the spirituality of the human being or the animals or whatever. So adam wa nefesh, the blood... You're not allowed to eat the blood of the animals. Why? Because you eat the blood of the animals. If you don't put salt right away after you slaughter the animal, and you're eating it with the blood, you're receiving all the negative from this animal. You're becoming an animal. You become lazy. You become uh, arrogant. You're attacking. You have no manners. Like animals in a the field, they all push. They all, you know, that's how it is in the nature. So Rambam answered to them like this. The Rambam wrote, when a person eats, remember the question, they ask about the resurrection of the dead and the days of Mashiach, and the Rambam ignored their question completely, and this is what he wrote to them. He wrote to them, when a person eats not kosher food, the food turns into blood. The blood is in the liver, and from the liver it climbs to the heart. That's where the even inclination is. And then from the heart it goes into the brain. That's where the soul is. And because the blood is an illegal blood, which means it was created against the laws of the manufacturer of the world, it contaminates the soul. 
and it makes the person an apikos, which means he is anti-religion, anti-Torah, anti-rabbis. Everything that the Torah say, he has a doubt, he has a question, proof, I don't believe it, baloney, they made it up, how do you know? We know plenty of people like this. So the Rambam says, and what made them like this? What made them like this? The food that they eat and they're not careful. However, he writes, Chazal, the sages, were extremely careful all their life, never to eat a food that has a doubt about it. Never. Never took a risk. And everything that came out of their mouth is pure and holy and aiming directly to the truth. That's the answer. Nothing about the He didn't answer them. Why? What's the point? What's the point explaining to a person that it's not kosher food about the Torah? His mind is completely contaminated with all the nonsense. You know how much more difficult you have to sweat until he gets something into his head? And what's the proof that this is 100% true? Our seminars. I said it once before and I say it again. In a fair, usually the seminars is three days. When the people get into the hotel on Friday afternoon, the first lecture is usually Friday evening. They are very anti. Everything, eh, no, proof to me, I don't believe it. Shabbat, they're coming down slowly, slowly. Sunday, especially Sunday afternoon, all of a sudden, each one of them became a rabbi, dancing with the rabbi, tzitziot, speaking in a microphone. I had the best Shabbaton in my life. What happened here? Some of them didn't even enter the lectures, I promise you. They were all, all the time outside with their cigarette or their laptop in the lobby of the hotel, on their phone. They hardly listened to 15 minutes a day Torah. Why all of a sudden... They come, they're completely different. Friday you were a religion hater, and all of a sudden, Sunday night, you're a rabbi. What changed? The food. Until now, they're home, they eat whatever they eat. Chinese pigs, Chinese cats. They go to the Chinese restaurant. Rabbi, I only eat chicken in a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> rabbi, I'm not that bad, you fool. The chicken you eat, five minutes ago they cook a cat for lunch, the Chinese workers. What do you think they eat? What do you think they eat? They eat dogs and cats and worms and snakes and they cook it over there. What do you think? They're waiting for your permission? That's what they eat every day. So the food that you eat by the Chinese restaurant, just an hour ago somebody warmed something in that oil. Or pork or anything else that they serve over there. Hey, how come I didn't think about it? Or the oven. Eh, five minutes ago they just heat something in that oven. So even if you eat noodles over there, ah, but it's only cold sesame noodles. Yeah, before it was cold, it was hot. Later it became cold and they put it in the fridge. When they put it inside whatever they cook it, what, what ingredients they use over there? What bowl they using? What pot? What woks they using? Just a minute ago it was a big fat pig inside. And now you're eating something marinated with that uh, pork. You come to Shamaim Hashem, at least one thing I never did. I never ate pork. <laughs> you never ate pork? Every week you ate five times pork. Me? <laughs> yeah. You ate Chinese, you ate chicken, sesame chicken, it's pork. Same thing pizza. Rabbi, pizza, what can be bad in pizza? It's only bread and cheese and tomato sauce. What? I'm very careful. Just five minutes ago, he put pepperoni inside the oven. They use the same thing, the same pan, the same everything. He cuts the pepperoni, a minute later, he cuts the cheese. The same thing, the same cutter. You're eating, every time you eat pizza in this store, it's like eating milk and, and, and meat together, seen from the Torah. Then you wonder why you cannot sit 15 minutes in a Torah lecture. You already sit on the top of the chair on the edge dying to live already? Why? As soon as you sit in a Torah lecture, you want to live, even if it's the best speaker in the world. Why? Your mind is so contaminated. If they will speak about sport, you sit until the morning. They'll speak about politics, 
this one, that president, the other congress one, this one, did you hear what happened? They sit until the morning. You speak about the size of the engine of the Ferrari, you sit until the morning. Speaking about the words of God, ten minutes later, I'm allergic. <laughs> Let's, how are we getting out of here? You understand? What is it? That's the truth. So the point is, we got to be very careful with what we eat. So, one other thing he says, Shmaya and Aftalion, don't have any business with the authorities. Stay away from them. Why? Today, you feel, look, I have connection. Look, I have connection with them. Tomorrow there's going to be a problem. I'll call my Congress friend. Uh, my, my cousin is arrested by the immigration. Do something. Five minutes later, he, he release him, right? He has the power. He calls somebody. Oh, five minutes later, you are. That, that's the good side. The bad side is that they get close to you. But when you really need them, they kick you and they don't care about you anything. Why? They don't want to show, oh, I'm his friend. When something goes wrong with you and you're going to be all over the headlines, the one who you donate millions of dollars to won't remember your name. Who? What do you mean who? For five years I'm donating to your elections every year. Now I'm calling you for help. You say who? Of course. He doesn't need you anymore. He knows you have a problem. He ran away. But the truth is they are speaking about something that applies to us. What does it mean? A person thinks, I'm going to get Medicaid, I'm going to get food stamps, I'm going to get weak, I'm going to get Section 8. Mm, look, very good, my life is very easy, half of my expenses are covered right there. It could be one year, five years, ten years. In the end, just when something goes wrong, <laughs> believe me, you regret every dollar you took from them, especially in these days. You have no idea how many religious people go to jail because they receive a few hundred dollars. Yeah, Medicaid fraud, they call it. Why? He made X amount of money and he added or he decreased 2%. Why? To match the application. Let's say he made, I don't know, 40,000, he needed to make 38. So he wrote 37,500. In the old days, when they had money, they were, you know, everything was okay, they didn't check. Now when they don't have money, everybody, they check with the magnifying glass. And when they catch one, they begin to see who was he in touch with. If they catch this organization, they see who did business with them, who did they wrote checks to, who, they, who gave them money. Oh, one! It's like a, a tower that collapsed one floor after the other. In moments. And this is what happened today. People, it's better that the authorities won't even know you exist. As soon as you come to this country, or you're born in this country, better never to apply to anything. Never. Not to here, not to there. <laughs> Even to make a driver's license, it doesn't pay. Why? You get a jury duty. <laughs> you have to go sit there for a month. It's a problem. Sometimes you can avoid it, sometimes you can't. So bottom line, the, some people here in this country, they don't have anything, not even a bank account. One guy told me, what? They don't even know I'm in this country. Nobody knows about me. Whatever ever happened, they call people emergency to the army. There's a big war, a world war, atomic war. They call all the men. I can sit home. Nobody knows I'm here. You understand? This is what they spoke about. The less you have business with them, the better you are. Then, he said, another recommendation to the Chachamim, to the rabbis. Be very careful what you say. Why? If you're going to say the wrong thing to the public, you will pay the price, because you're responsible. What is going to be the price? You will have to go out to exile. You sit in Israel, Hashem will send you away. And there will be a chain reaction to what you say. You taught wrong to these people, and they will taught wrong to the next one, and to the next generation, and, and it could be hundreds of years. Everyone does the, does the wrong thing. It's going to cause Chilul Hashem. Why? Look what's going on here. When did it start? It could start three, four hundred years ago. Then we continue. Hillel and Shammai received from Shmaya and Naftalion. As I told you, Hillel was their student. And also Shammai. When you speak about Torah Shebaal Peh, Oral Torah, 
it really starts from Hillel and Shammai. Why? Because until the time of Hillel and Shammai, there was no arguments about the halacha. Everybody knew the oral Torah, what's the law. From the students of Shammai, and from the students of Hillel, all the machlokot started. This will remember, if somebody asks you, how come there's so many opinions when it comes to the law? Allowed, not allowed, according to him you're allowed, according to him you're not allowed, according to him sometimes yes, sometimes no, what's going on, I'm confused. When did it start? The generation after, right after Shammai and Hillel, that generation, all the arguments started. Make no mistake that even if there are arguments in the halacha, it's not relevant to us. Why? Because the Torah already told us when there is a disagreement between two opinions, three opinions, five opinions, what does the Torah say? We have rules of psika, which means we know how to set the rules. Right? Remember, if it's minority against majority, so we follow the majority. In quality, not in quantity, which means one big rabbi sometimes can be equal like a thousand mediocre ones. Get the point or not? Sometimes when you have a very important question about life and death, about a new business that can go in, is going to affect your family, who knows, for the next 20, 30 years, about moving from America to Israel or from Israel to America, this is very hard questions because a mistake right here can cause you so much problems after, right? The children, the parnassah, the health, the government, jails, who knows? There's so many hard things. Questions like this, you don't just ask a local rabbi, even your own rabbi. You go to the chief ones. We have a few very big rabbis in the world. Still, we still have. Another 10, 20 years, the way it looks right now, we won't have anybody left. But right now, we still have few big chief rabbis. Who are they? Rav Chaim Kanievsky, Rav Ovadia Yosef, Rav Steinman, Rav Eliashiv, Rav Wozner. Maybe 10, 20 big, big ones. That are all older than 90 years old. All of them. Who knows? I hope they will live to 120 and more if it's possible. But as it looks right now, they're very, very old already. Once this generation will be transferred to heaven, who are going to ask questions of life and death? Today, we have a very, I hate to say it, but you have to say the truth. We have already a new moda. A new, uh, a new fashion in the religious world. Uh, I have to make a decision about life and death. Let's call that Baba. Rabbi, I live in that street. What's the number of your house? Number three. Okay, it's good. Do the deal. What is, what's the connection? Oh, you live over there? Oh, good. It's a good number. You do the business. Uh, Rabbi, I want to marry her. What's her name? What's her mother's name? Oh, let me see. Okay, the names, I'm checking the names. Okay, the names are good. You can ma get married. No, be very careful. Don't marry her. The names are not good. What is all this nonsense? What about her? She's a kosher girl. She comes from a good home. She went to good yeshivot, good school. She's modest. She's a polite person. Marry her. She's bad. She's not modest. Hashem irachem, her reputation. Who cares about her name? She's not good. She can have the best name in the world, perfect match with the names, but she's not a good one. They don't even ask these questions anymore. Sometimes, by the way, she's a good girl? Yeah, whatever that means, good girl, according, <laughs> depends who you ask, right? So, for some people, a good girl is a model. Right? You ask, go to Israel, ask the teenage, who's a good girl? This Rebitzen, that cover from A to Z, she learns, she reads Tehillim, she prays, she raises the kids, she's Balat Chesed, she helps the poor. You know, sh sh oh, her or oh, her? This bimbo all over the streets, the way she dressed on the media. Who, do you, who, you, who are you dreaming to be like? Her? Or, God forbid, like her? I want to be like her. That's the, so, so it depends who you ask. According to some fools, she's better. Why? Because she showed her body that she didn't eat for three years. <laughs> Very nice. Let's clap to her that she's tall and skinny. Beautiful. <laughs> Rabbi, you don't understand. You know, she goes like this. I, I, you know, I want to marry her. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> no, this is good. 
I'm telling you, listen, look. Don't be a fool. I say it almost by now, every, every week, every month. It seems to me that it's not, it's, people are not getting the point. You don't ask people with remote control. Does he know you? Does he know who you are? No, this is not the right way. You want to ask a question in halacha, Rabbi, should we move to Israel or not? You have to write all the details you can. This is what I do. I'm here for such and such years. We married for so many years. We have so, five kids. They learn in these places. They're doing very well in school. They're doing very bad in school. My parnasa is very good or is not good. I cannot find a job. Uh, we have this problem. My wife is uh, sick or she needs treatment. And the treatment... Everything you can think of, even though it's wrong. The more details he has, Baruch Hashem, they're very smart. They can see things that you don't see. But at least they know what to answer. Yes, leave everything and come quickly to Israel. This is a decision of life and death. What do you think? Eh, let's just move to Israel. We have some money, we'll manage. No. How do you know if your kids going to have good schools? Where are you going to go? Who told you that your kids can uh, manage in a, in, a, in a school there, an elementary school? They don't know one word in Hebrew. They, they're already in 7th grade, 8th grade, you put them in, the level of the learning there, it's anyway much higher than here. As it is, now without the language, it's like taking a kid today and sending him to a Hasidic yeshiva that they speak Yiddish in 8th grade. Who's <laughs> there? He doesn't understand anything, it's like Chinese over there. He sits there in a class for three months, the poor guy, he's clever, but he doesn't understand the language. Yeah. I'm just giving examples, not necessarily this is only the problem, there's many other things to consider. Sometimes it's the mentality of your wife. Let's say your wife is American, she grew up here, like we say in Hebrew, prima donna. She likes, you know, shopping, nice car, beautiful clothes, she goes here and there, she has ladies tea. Now you're going to put her in neighborhood in Israel, screaming, ah, in the neighborhood, she'll go to the press. She'll be depressed. Ah, oh, so, uh, so very nice. You have a lot of money there. You have a good business there. But, but, <laughs> but if the center of the family is depressed, what good is your life? Or the other way around. Sometimes a person wants to go to America. Maybe he can do business. Well, what, is, what about his wife? She comes here. She's alone. There's so many things to consider. That's why a person needs, when it comes to important question, not to go to somebody, what's your name? What's your mother's name? How long are you here? Okay, good, you can go. No problem. Mazal, Baruch Hashem, Mazal Ubracha. I gave an example. David Amelech is good enough for you? Right? David Amelech, you read Tehilim once in your life, no? Once? You saw the level of David Amelech. Okay, I don't have to tell you who was he. One of the holiest people ever lived. One day he comes to Nathan. Who is Nathan? In English, Nathan. <laughs> Nathan. Nathan the prophet. He comes to him and says, I want to build Bet HaMikdash, I have a dream. I want to build a house for Hashem in, Yer in Yerushalayim. So the Nathan, the prophet, Mazal Tov, good luck, you should be Matzliach, you should be successful, you build it, it will be great, he gives him all the blessings. You should do it. Then the prophet goes to sleep. Hashem came to him in a dream and said, excuse me, Mr. Nathan, with all due respect, you're the prophet of the world. Did you ask me? Did I give you any prophecy? Did I tell you that King David is the one who has to build my temple? No, it's against my opinion. I don't want him to build it. He can make the foundation. But he, he was in a war. And even though everyone who he ever killed deserved to die is a war, still... Hands that spill blood of people cannot build the holiest place in the world. With all the respect, he's not guilty of anything. But reality-wise, his hands killed people. I don't want him to build the Beta Mikdash. I can, I, can, I can agree that he will make the foundation. So that everything the Prophet told him a few hours ago was all wrong. If the Prophet that all the rabbis in the world, million times combined, will not get to 1% of his level, prophet that speaks to Hashem, how many we have like this in the world today? If he made a mistake, he was rushed to answer out of his excitement, then for sure you have to be very careful who you ask today. So enough, enough with this nonsense. Rabbi, this deal, this, that, they make this gula, put something in a corner of the house, 
It's a little, the Judaism is a little bit deeper than this, much more deeper. And then also another thing, let's open a book and see what the Torah has to say. When do you open the book? When? When there's no other choice. When you tried everything and you don't have an answer, what do I have to lose? I'm going to do any, anyway, I'm going to do something. So I might as well try, maybe Hashem will give me an answer. Maybe I deserve to get it. I'll give you an example. I once, uh, one time I had a lecture in Brooklyn. I used to have lectures every Wednesday. But not like here. One, one and a half hours, and everyone falls asleep. No. <laughs> Over there, it was fight, wars, until, uh, until the morning. Four, five in the morning, people still screaming and arguing. All the Israelis of Brooklyn used to come that Wednesday night, starting 9, 9.15, all the way to the morning. One o'clock... We still have groups of people coming in. They know the lecture is all the way to the morning. <laughs> One o'clock, you have a group. They just came from a club in Manhattan. They walk into the lecture. That's how it was. <laughs> so one time, I'm getting to Brooklyn. I have to pick up a Yemenite Israeli guy. We agree before that I'm picking him up before the lecture. He comes with me to the lecture, and then he goes back with me to Monsi to the yeshiva, that he comes to the yeshiva. When I get to Avenue U there over there in Brooklyn, I call him up, I say, Ron, I'm downstairs, come down. He said, no, there's a problem, he lives with his father, him and his father, and he says, my father is angry that I told him that I want to go to the yeshiva, not this week, maybe next week. I'm not ready, I didn't prepare anything. I said, what's going on here? We made a, we made a plan, no, I came, I'm downstairs here, and I don't have that much time, I have a lecture. Calm down. He said, no, I, I explained to you, I can't. You know, I, I had a big argument with my father. He heard that I want to go to yeshiva. I say, I have to go to work. What is this? So I can't. <laughs> so I told him, I'm very sorry. It's not such a, a, a small decision. It's a big responsibility. If I, don't, if I leave you here, who knows what's going to happen with your soul? I came here, I have to take you to yeshiva. It's a, it's a deal. No, yeah, we're arguing. Then he said, okay, okay, let me come downstairs, because I guess his father was getting angry <laughs> that he's not hanging the phone on me. So he said, let me come downstairs. He comes downstairs. We argue, not exaggerating, maybe half an hour on the street. Then they're starting to call. It's already 9.30. The people calling. What's up? The house is packed. What's going on? I say, I'm here, but I have an emergency. No, you have to come. It's not fair. It's half an hour. I say, you see what you're doing? He said, go, go. They're right. Go. I said, I'm not leaving without you. I don't care. Let them wait until the morning. I take you with me. He said, no, don't do this to me. Everything I tried, I couldn't do anything. So now, I have nothing to lose. Anyway, I lost the case. No, I'm about to leave. That's it. The guy's stubborn. He doesn't want to come. I say, you know what? I have a chumash. Let's ask Hashem what he says. You promise to do whatever comes out? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, you, open, you say a prayer to Hashem and you open the book. And we'll go on the right side. What's the message? You're going to do it? I said, no jokes. If he says something that you have to come with me, you cannot play games. It's not a joke. So, okay, let's do it. <laughs> we say, okay, repeat after me. We say a prayer together and say, open. He opened it up. First row on the right. <laughs> Unbelievable. It says, V'anish'arim b'chem. Imaku ba'avonam asher ma'alubi. So mean? Those of you who is going to stay will die that they betrayed me. <laughs> so I said, give me five minutes. I started to, I'm, I'm he ran quickly, he brought a bag the size of a car, a big bag, he put everything inside. I took him to the yeshiva, today is a rabbi in Israel. Just imagine, if I wouldn't have this idea, we would lose him. But just like this, to make it a business, to see it, accept people every day, okay, hop, okay, you can go to Israel, hop, you don't go, it doesn't work that way, what is this? You have to investigate the person, what are, what, what's your plans, how long you're in school, how long you have left, how much money you put into it, who pays for it, uh, uh, so many questions. And this is it. The people don't know, and they just make, this, make mistakes. What do you want? The rabbi told me. <laughs> the rabbi told you. Of course, based on the number of the house that you live in. The rabbi told you, are you allowed or you're not allowed? Baruch Hashem. <laughs> so, yeah, 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 the truth hurts. <laughs> so, then, so, Hillel and Shammai 
say, you have to be like the students of Aaron. Aaron, the brother of Moshe, Oef Shalom, he loves peace. Rodef Shalom, not only he loves peace, there are many people who love peace and do nothing about it. Now there is an extra level. Not only I love peace, I run to do everything I can to make peace. You understand the point, the difference? Just to love peace and be home, I'm not involved. Don't get me involved. Why not? You can come and make peace between two enemies. This is what Hashem wants. No, 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 don't get me involved in it. I don't like these arguments, no. Aaron used to run. He tells Shimon, you know, you had a fight with Reuven. Reuven just told me, I spoke to him before. He said that he loves you. He regretted that he had a fight with you. He made up the whole story. Reuven didn't tell him anything. Then he goes to Shimon, he tells him the same thing. Then he invites both of them to his house and make peace. Because the, the ego is not a factor here anymore. Before, what? He's not respecting me. He, he kicked me out of his home. He's this, he's that. Now all of a sudden when he heard that his enemy is not such an enemy, he likes him and he's regretting and all this. And that's how he used to make peace. So the Mishnah say, be like them, like Aaron and his student. Running after peace, always. You have to love every person, respect every person. He didn't say love every Jew. That's needless to say, because the Torah called it your brother. You have to love your brother. You don't love your brother. Who do you love? Love all the people. Bria means somebody that was created. Bara, Bria, right? So every human being, Rav Yaakov Kaminetsky, Zecher Tzadik Livracha, was a big rabbi in Monsi. On Sunday, he used to walk in the streets where he was, his yeshiva. He ran to the goyim and say, hello, have a good week, hello. What does he have to do with them? Is they going to the church? There's a little church over there. They don't even have a minyan. They have 20 acres. They don't even have a minyan there. And he used to run to say hello to them. Oev et abriot. Oev et abriot. And what else? Make sure you make all the people close to the Torah as much as you can. Not only by teaching Torah. Not everybody can be a rabbi. You have a business, you're going to work. Mekarvam la Torah means they love how you behave and they want to be like you. You understand what's going on? Oh, where did you learn all these things that you're speaking about? I go to this lecture every week. Oh, you know what? Tell me where I also come. What made him come? He saw how you talk, how you behave, and then he likes it. Wow, you know what? I also want to be like this. That's called Mekarvam la Torah. How you pray how you have confidence in Hashem, how much tzedakah you give, it makes good impression on people. You know what? I want to be like this guy. This is my goal, my, uh, my, uh, uh, this is something to, Im to imitate, not all the garbage out there. Then, this, is, this Mishnah is complicated. The 13th Mishnah, the first chapter, this is it, it's in Aramic. Hillel say that Mishnah in Aramic. Usually the Mishnayot is all in Hebrew. But here this Mishnah is in Aramic. What does he say? Negad Shma Avad Shme Udela Mosif Yesif Udela Yalef Ktala Chayav Vedishmash Betag Achalaf Very complicated to understand this Mishnah. To make a long story short, I'll explain the words. Somebody that is doing everything to be famous. He wants honor, respect. He's pushing everywhere. Put my name here. Put my thing, put my picture here, do this, make sure you tell everyone about me, do, you know, this is all his goal. In the end, the reputation that he already had until now, even this is going to lose. Which means, if you learn, let's say, X amount of years to run, you have supposedly a good reputation of a good person. By behaving like this, even the good name that you had until now, People will get tired of you. You lose even this. It doesn't pay. Then the Mishnah continue. Vedela Mosif, somebody who doesn't learn Torah every day and does not grow daily, daily, not annually, daily, every day you have to grow in Torah. Yasif, guaranteed that the Torah that he already learned, he will forget. He will forget that as well. You know, it's like hot water. If you have a pot and you spill hot water to the pot, as long as you continue to put hot water, the water inside always stay hot. Once you stop, 
it gets cold. It doesn't, that's it, it's cold already. Same thing here. If you do not add more Torah every day, the little that you know, or even if you know a lot, eventually you forget everything. The only way you remember everything is if you constantly make your brain working and learning all the time every day. That's what the Chazal said that Hashem says, Im yom, yomayim ezveka. If you're going to leave me one day, I would leave you for two days, measure for measure. Right? Uh, you know, there used to be a rabbi, his name was Shagat Arye. That was his nickname, his title, Shagat Arye. What is it, Shagat Arye? The roaring of the lion. Like when he opened up his mouth, everyone are so impressed from him. And he was very, very, very poor, extremely poor. You know, poor people of the old days were really, really poor, not like today. Today people can be poor, they still have a beautiful suit and a tie. They look like, uh, uh, like millionaires on the street. He walks with his bag, he doesn't have five dollars in his bank account. Look at him, you don't know, you cannot tell the difference between a rich and a poor, not always today. But in the old days, somebody that was poor, there's no way to make mistakes. He had one outfit all his life. And there's a hole, they put a patch, and another patch, and another patch. You see, and his shoes are ripped. And this is the way they are, these people. So the, one time, in the old days, they used to have a tradition that in every shul, they have guests. Let's say guests are going from one town to the other, on a donkey, or walking. Most people, the poor people, couldn't even afford a donkey. So they walk. For hundreds of miles a year, they walk. From one place to the other. They walk to learn Torah, they walk to find a job, they walk. Not like today, you get in a plane two hours later in Florida. They used to walk a lot. So every Shabbat, they see on Friday strangers in a shul. You have a place to eat for Shabbos? No. So they had one Gabbai that is in charge of setting up the guests in families in the area. So what the rabbi saw a poor man in a shul. Very poor man, older person. You ask him, are you from here? He said, no. You have a place for Shabbos? He said, no, okay, come to my house for Shabbos. He invites him. So he comes to his house. The, the minhag, the, they used to ask the guest to say Dvar Torah. Every guest that comes, maybe will learn something new from him. We don't know where he comes from. Maybe he will tell us a chidush, something new. So the rabbi told the poor man, tell us is a Dvar Torah. So he's starting to say a beautiful speech. In the end, he doesn't give credit to what book he learned it from. The Torah said that when you learn Torah from someone, when you repeat it to somebody else, you have to give credit to your teacher, to the one who taught you that. So you say, I heard in the name of this rabbi. I heard from that rabbi. I heard from this. I heard from there. I read in that book. That's show that you're a humble person. You don't take other people's Torah and brag about it like it's yours. It shows that you're humble. It's very good. You bring salvation to the world by not being a, a, a Mr. Big Shot. So the poor guy, he said the entire speech, and in the end he doesn't give credit to the rabbi. So the rabbi say, you know, everything he say comes from the book Shagat Arye. And he didn't give him credit. Let's not say everything. Tomorrow I'll test him again. Tomorrow after the davening, they eat Shabbos morning, he told him, can you tell us Dvar Torah? He say a beautiful Dvar Torah from the same book of the Shagat Arye, and in the end he doesn't say, I learned it by the Shagat Arye. The rabbi is furious. He said, wow, look at this guy. He's telling me everything from this book, and he doesn't give credit to the book. The Shabbos afternoon, Seuda Shlishit, again he said Dvar Torah, and the rabbi said, no, this time I'm not going to tolerate this. He said the same Dvar Torah, and he doesn't give credit to the Shagat Aryev. So the rabbi say, you know, you have beautiful Divrei Torah. But there's one thing I cannot stand, is people coming here and giving us beautiful Divrei Torah from a book, and they don't even say where they learn it from. Come, I'm going to show you everything that you said, what book it's in. He goes to his shelf. He pulled a beautiful big book covered with leather, nice, antique, beautiful book. He said, come, what you said yesterday, look, it's right here. And what you said this morning, it's right here. And what you just said now, it's right here, word by word. Mamash, like a copy. 
you're not embarrassed to say one word for the rabbi Shagat Arye? So the poor man say, Ah, Baruch Hashem, in the books, I look so much better than my real life. <laughs> so the rabbi say, What? Say, Yeah, it's me. I'm, I'm this rabbi. But they didn't know, remember, there was no internet, no media that you know the faces of all the rabbis. You don't know, see an old man come with his, his cane, he comes to your house, he's the biggest giant in the world, and you see him walking like this with ripped shoes, he's very poor. So he said, look at my life, how poor I am. But in the book, fancy, beautiful leather, everything nice. In the book I look much better than my life. This is it. So now, going back to the Mishnah, so he said, you must continue to learn Torah. If not, you lose the one you know. Who the liar leave, somebody who doesn't learn, kat lachayav, what's the point of living? Every day you live, it's, it's almost like a mistake, lichora. What's the point of keeping you here? Why is Hashem even bothering to keep you here if you don't learn Torah? What are you doing here exactly? So you know, you should know, that you really deserve to pass away from this world if you don't learn. If you learn, you are busy with what you're supposed to do. But if not, you should know that every day you live is chesed, kindness, mercy. But you didn't really deserve it. And somebody who used the Torah to gain honor, to be a show-off, what's going to be? he will be passed away from the world and all kinds of opinions, what's going to be with him, but it's definitely not the purpose of learning Torah. If a person wants to learn Torah because I want to be a big shot, I want to be famous, I want to be all over the media, whatever, that's not what Hashem is looking for. Hashem is interested that people learn Torah for the truth of the Torah. Then, this is a very important Mishnah, it's the 14th Mishnah, who I Omer, Im en anili mili. Hillel, it's all continuation of what Hillel Azaken used to say. Im en anili mili. Kshani latsmi mani, veim lo achshav ematai. This is a critical Mishnah. You hear it in all the lectures. Why? Because it's a very important Mishnah. What does it say here? If I will not take care of myself, nobody will do the job for me. You understand? If I won't take care of my soul, nobody will purify the soul for me. Nobody will prepare my next life for me. I have to do it. And, when I'm alone by myself, without Hashem's help, money, I'm nothing. Like dust in the wind, nothing. And if not now, when? Remember, three steps here. First, if I'm not going to take care of myself, nobody will. Get it through your head. And when I'm going to be alone without Hashem helps, I'm worthless. With all my ambitions, ambition, it won't help. I still need Hashem to help me every step I do. And if not now, when? If I won't do it now, Rabbi, when I'm retired, all day I'll come to the yeshiva, I promise you. Right now, you know, I have businesses, where do I have time? Well, find me an hour a day that I have time to leave my businesses and come to learn. That's the way people talk. Rabbi, I only finish this deal, I take off for three weeks, I come to the yeshiva. Many excuses. Rabbi, when I get married, my wife will replace me in a store, I have somebody to help me, I'm going to have some time to learn. And many, many excuses. The Torah say, no. Torah say, Al tomar Don't ever dare to say, when I will have time, I will learn Torah. Why? You will never have the time. You will never have the time. Why? Hashem won't give you the time. Why? Because you had the time today. You don't want to learn today, nobody promise you in a year from now you'll be able to learn. The Rambam writes, in Ilchot Talmud Torah, the laws of learning Torah, Every Jew is obligated to learn Torah, even a poor person that walks all day and knocks on people's door back for a few coins just to bring bread home that they won't starve and they sit freezing at home, his children. The most miserable poor person must learn Torah every day. But Rabbi, if I, if I will come to the yeshiva for two or three hours a day, 
the little that I collect takes three hours away. I don't know how I'm going to bring food home. No excuses. You must, you have to trust God. The Torah is more important than eating. Nobody ever forgets to eat. You saw any person that sometimes forget to eat for three days? Oh, they remember. The, body, the stomach reminds you that you have to eat every 20 minutes. In America, it's very popular. Snacks. You have to send the kids to school with snacks. <laughs> God forbid they won't eat a candy an hour. Wow, or pretzel or something. Wow, snacks. Sometimes if the mother forgot to send snacks, she has to drive 20 minutes to the school to bring a piece of a, a bag of bamba. <laughs> Poor kid, you know. <laughs> so, to feed the soul, everyone seems to forget. To feed the body, nobody ever forgets. Rabbi Ovadia Yosef once told a beautiful mashal. He says, the body and the soul, it's like the male chicken and the female chicken. What's the difference between the male chicken and the female chicken? If you do not feed the female chicken a few hours, you don't throw some uh, seeds of wheat on the floor, the female makes a lot of noise. Flying all over the house, breaking everything, the chandelier, the pictures, everything. You cannot mess with the female. Right away you have to throw food on the floor. If not, your house is destroyed. If you don't feed the male... What happened? It doesn't make a beep. Five hours, ten hours, up, all of a sudden you see, he fell and died. <laughs> hey, wake up, one second. Wait, let me run, get some food, too late. He's dead already. Rav Ovadia Yosef say the female chicken, it's the body. The male chicken is the soul. The body, if you don't feed the body, six hours already, headache. I'm, I'm dizzy, I cannot go work now. I didn't eat for six hours, leave me alone. Tomorrow when I have food, Yom Kippur, 10 in the morning, oof, I, I'm dying, I, I don't have my coffee. You know, all Yom Kippur, he suffer for one reason, thinking about the food. By the way, next Yom Kippur, remember me that this is the rule. All day you suffer in shul, you pray, and you're only thinking about the coffee or the water or the... Cheese Danish, whatever you like to eat every day. Once Yom Kippur is over, no one is in a rush. Everyone stands, stands to talk. Hey, what? What happened? All day you're dying. Let me run. Just one sip from my coffee. All of a sudden, when it's over, no one is pressure. No more headache. Nobody is starving. Why? It's all in the head. You have to understand one thing. The psychology of the person is that... What you are not allowed, the evil inclination always makes sure to bother you about it. Once it became allowed, there's nothing to bother you because you can go and eat. It stop bothering you. That's why you don't care. You only suffer because it wasn't allowed. Once it becomes allowed, you don't suffer anymore. You can go another day. Let's go until the next day, I hear some people say. At a giver, let's stay for tomorrow without eating. Ah, all day you suffer. Because now it's allowed. Same thing, it's called mind gnuvim imtaku. Stolen water are sweeter. Chazal say, if you take water, you bought it for two dollars, it's water. Stole it, ah, it's sweeter. It's an expression. Which means a person goes with a girl that she's permitted to him. They got married, she's his wife. He's not so excited for her. But when he goes with her in a scene, his excitement is much greater. What's the proof that you have yet Sarara, every person? What's the proof? I made a proof on my own. There's millions of proofs, but a proof that I thought about it. I saw once that they made, they made a survey and they asked people... <laughs> They took them to a club, to a nightclub, and there were two identical twins ladies. One married, with a, with a diamond ring on her finger, and one single. Identical twins, you cannot tell the difference between them. And they made a survey, they took ten guys, all night, one after the other, and they take them in and out. Who were they aiming to take her home? Almost all of them went to the married one. Why? 
You have married one, she belongs to another man, and you have a single one. You want a girlfriend? Go to the single one. It's no difference here. Hey, if one of them is pretty, the other one is not so... No, I understand where you come from. But if the same exact... You cannot tell the difference. Why are you speaking to the married one? What, are you crazy? She's a married woman. The Yetzirah. That's what people do. I love the, the, the danger. I love the excitement. It's, you know... Oh, that is fool. It's all Yetzirah. And that's why... Boyfriends and girlfriends, they have a harmony until the day of the marriage. An hour after the marriage, <laughs> the harmony flew out of the window. Why? Until now, the Satan was celebrating. Every time they touch each other, horrible scenes. Scarret, carret, carret. The Satan is dancing. Oh, I'm sinking them more and more and more in hell. Now when it became legal, the Satan is not interested that they'll have peace. He decided, all the harmony he made between them, up, he's running away. And all of a sudden, Rabbi, you know, in Israel, there's a very interesting thing. The most popular, I mean, not popular, the most uh, common, common divorce cases is couples who live together in the same apartment for many years. It's unbelievable. You may think, after they live seven years together, they already know each other from every possibility. That's it. They are set for life. Wow, seven years together? Look. As soon as they get married, three months later, they come to the Rabbanut, filing for divorce. And what's the reasons of the divorce? Why you want to divorce him? He stink. I don't like his breath. <laughs> seven years you live with him, he didn't know about his problem. No, the Satan didn't let her suffer from it. Uh, he smokes all over the house. I can't take this anymore. Every day we fight over this. I don't like this life. Oh, he's stingy. What do you mean stingy? Seven years, everything was fine. All of a sudden he became stingy. All the answers are answers that obviously they should have known about it. But somehow they didn't realize. But once it became legal, the Satan went away. He finished his job. Now manage on your own. That's how it works. It's called Mind Gnuvin Imtaku. That's Yetzerara, even inclination. So, uh, we, before we finish, I, ho I hope to finish this parak. We have one or two more Mishnayot left. So, Hillel say, remember, you want your tefillin to get to Israel with you? Make sure it's in your bag and the plane. You send it by the suitcases. Maybe you will get there, maybe you will get to London and be stuck there for a month because there is a, 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 a mountain fire smokes all over Europe. Maybe your feeling will get there, maybe not. You bring it on your own, for sure it comes with you there. You come to learn Torah, you earn it. You want to die and make your children do Kaddish for you and donate to yeshivot, maybe to help your soul. Maybe they will, maybe not. Right now it's in your hand to do it. Why you don't do it? Many rich people, before they die, they can take all their millions and donate it to Torah. Come to the rabbi. Rabbi, I have $20 million. I will leave some for my kids to help them out, but I want most of the money. I'm putting it in a fund for you, and I want you to give it to the guys to learn Torah for my soul. That's a smart person before he dies. But most people are not smart. What do they do? They leave it by the hands of their kids, hoping they'll do something for their soul. Why didn't you take care of yourself? Why you count on your boy to do it? His mind is to buy a Mercedes. You think he cares about your soul? And even if he does, to some extent, he cares about himself a lot more. It's natural. You have to take care of yourself. Mara said Rabbi Tarfon was a very wealthy person. He gave a lot of money to Rabbi Akiva to go buy him real estate, field, some acres. He said, buy me a good lot. Investment. So Rabbi Akiva went. He came back. He said, you bought me a lot? He said, beautiful. I bought you great property. <laughs> After a few years, one day Rabbi Tafon was very wealthy. He said, can you show me what you bought for me? Where is the place? He said, come, I'll take you to see your investment. He take him to yeshiva, see a guy sitting and learning Torah. He took his money 
and went and opened up yeshiva for him, and he gave them all the money, so you sit here for years with this, whatever it was, a million dollar, let's say, according to today's money, take the money and sit and learn Torah all the time for the merit of Rabbi Tarfon. That's his money, he sponsored your Torah, finish. He didn't ask him permission. So he says to him, what? I gave you money to buy me real estate, you went and opened yeshiva for me, you give the money, all the money to the Torah? He say, yeah, I did something better for what you asked me. What the property will bring you? What? What the property will bring you? Some more money? Baruch Hashem, you have money. Now, you already have billions of mitzvot. So he blessed him. He thanked him. Why? He, was a tz- he knew he's a tzaddik. He won't get upset. He won't get upset. So... Shanili, if you think that you do everything on your own, you don't realize that Hashem is helping you, but what you only do is you're the right decision. If you decide to do it, Hashem helps you. If you do not decide, it won't happen. If you don't do it today, tomorrow and maybe too late. One time we had a guy in, uh, in Staten Island, Arnon, his name, Alava Shalom. Why I say Alava Shalom? He died 22 years old. This guy was a key, American kid that his parents are Israelis, they came to Staten Island, and we've been begging him to come to the seminars. Come. Yeah, yeah, I promise I come. He doesn't show up. Another seminar. I promise I come. This time for sure I come. He doesn't show up. The third seminar, we talked to him who knows how many times. I promise you, I know I messed up twice, but this time I promise you I come. I promise you. I said, okay, I trust your word, but remember, twice you messed up, no more. He said, I give you my word, 100%. Friday night, 10 minutes before Shabbat, I'm in a hotel. My head is only about one person, this guy, Arnon. I'm eating my heart. I said, this guy fooled us three times. How did I buy this story? Thinking to myself, ah, I should have gone myself, put him in the car, forced him to come, because obviously he's not keeping his promise. Motzei Shabbos, we found out that he was found dead on a couch. Whatever the reason of the dead, who knows drugs, whatever happened, I don't know what happened there. 22 years old. And they found a bag packed to come to the seminar. I was ready. Why I'm telling you the story? If he would come the first or the second time, it wouldn't happen. He would already be in yeshiva, today would be a big rav. He would have kids, grandkids. They all learn Torah. His account will get billions of mitzvot every week. And what happened in the end? He died Mechalel Shabbat with earring here, tattoos. That's how he died. Hair, all kinds of color, orange. You should see how he looked. Like a rock star. That's how he looked. So think about it. Also another story similar to that. There's a guy in Monsi. His name is Sharon. He used to manage shofar organization for Rabbi Amnon Yitzchak in America. He was like in charge of everything, the officer. So obviously he likes to bring people to Mansi to make them religious. So he keeps telling me, I have a friend, he's a driver in Har Sinai car service in Borough Park. Mount Sinai car service. He's about 42, 43 years old. He has a black Christian girlfriend that he lives with her in the apartment for a few years. And every time he invites him to my house for Shabbat, and he doesn't show up. Then he comes to me Thursday night, he said, this time, for sure he comes. I had a very long talk with him. He gave me a guarantee that tomorrow he comes to your house. So very good. Finally, we see who the guy is. Friday night, he didn't show up. Sunday, I go to the yeshiva, I come to this guy, Sharon, what happened? He didn't come. I said, don't ask. Just before he left the door, she took a knife and stabbed him in the heart and killed him. Didn't hear on the news? It's all over the news. He already had a bag. That's what the Mishnah says. If not now, tomorrow will be too late. Return one day before, Chazal say. What do you mean one day before? One day before it's too late. Who guaranteed that you wake up in the morning? That means right now. Right now. Tomorrow could be too late. Tomorrow could be, and if we leave tomorrow, we are still subject to a punishment. Why? Because Hashem will have a very big claim against us. How did you gamble to take such a risk 
to go one more day without being righteous and doing the right thing. That means you have no fear from the, from the truth. The fact that you wait, you're willing to wait another week until you become a Shomer Shabbos, I'm willing, next week I'll become modest. Next week I'll cover my head. Next week I'm going to put my kid in yeshiva instead of a public school. And, and you will live one week, and you will do it, as you promise. You will. The fact that you waited another week, sure, you don't care about Hashem, and you're not afraid of anything. Because what would happen if you die tomorrow? You die with zero. That means you're not afraid. A person that is afraid, he cannot sleep at night. He's, ner- he's nervous. If something will happen to me, <coughs> I will die ra- wicked. It doesn't bother him. That means he has no irat shamayim, no fear for Hashem. No fear for Hashem. Shammai said, until, until now he was Hillel, Shammai said, I say Torah tcha keva. Make sure the Torah for you is your real business in life. Every other business that you have, real estate, uh, retail, whatever you have, has to be your hobby. The extra business. Right now your Torah should be the most important thing for you. And Sham I also say, say very little and do a lot. Don't be like these big shots. They talk non-stop and in the end they do zero. Talk very little and do a lot. I'm going to help. I'm going to send Bezrat Hashem a hundred dollars. All of a sudden he sent a thousand. Why? That's the right way. Some people, I'm going to make 10,000 CDs. Put me the first one in the list. In the end, he sends $18. A lot of noise they make. I had one guy, without saying names, I can only tell you that he's from Queens. I gave a lecture in Bet Gabriel. It was about a month, a month, five weeks ago. On the way there, he called me up. He speaks to me, this and this. I don't know exactly the whole conversation, but I told him, I know you for 10 years. Every time I speak to you, you praise me like nobody ever does. You speak again about me to all the people. You know who I am. You love what I do. And in the end, 10 years I know you. You help all kinds of things. You give donations to all kinds of places. And not until this moment you sponsor one CD of mine. Where is the logic here? So he got shocked for a second. He said, what do you mean? He started to mumble. I, I said, I know what I'm talking about. I know you for about 10 years. You never sponsor one dollar CDs. And he's a very rich guy. So why are you telling me all these beautiful speeches? I would rather not to hear all these praises from you and help the, to make CDs that we can give to people to become religious. So he says to me, after your lecture tonight, come to my house, if you come to my house, I promise you 1,000 CDs. I said, no, I don't have time to come to your house. I finish the lecture. Then I have people who wait online to speak to me. By the time I finish there, I have an appointment in Manhattan at 11 o'clock, 11.30. I have to go to Manhattan. How, how am I going to find the time to come to you? He said, this is the deal. I don't care. You come to my house. If you show up before 11 o'clock, a thousand CDs I sponsor, guarantee. I give you my word. Say to myself, you know, not for me. Well, a thousand CDs can be a hundred uh, Shomri Shabbos. You give them out. People become religious every day. I see results every day. Emails, emails. I became religious from this CD. I became religious from this CD who got me into the website. And now, Baruch Hashem, a one man Shomri Shabbos. Every day, seven, ten, fifteen, like this. Every day. Who sponsored these CDs? People like you, the ordinary people, 200, 105, whatever it is. And this is a very wealthy guy. Say to myself, you know what? I'll let the people in Manhattan wait an hour, half an hour extra, and I'll go to his house, not for me, for a few more souls that we can save. I went to his home. <laughs> Two minutes I was there. I said, okay, now I have an appointment. I got to run. I came. I got there 10.52. <laughs> I walked through the door. So you see, I came before 11. He said, no, what, do you want to come in and out? You have to sit at least 20 minutes, he tells me. Okay, I said, 20 minutes, what can I do? For a thousand CDs, I'm willing to do it. <laughs> I sat there, he told me all the nonsense. Believe me, it was very boring. In the end, we are five weeks after. No CDs, no phone calls, no nothing. There are people who talk non-stop. I did, and I will do, and I will do, and they do nothing in the end. Nothing in the end. By the way, you should know, 
The more a person speaks about mitzvot that he's going to do, the Satan fights against him harder not to do it. That's what we call Al Tiftach Pela Satan. Hazal says, if you go to learn Torah, don't say, I'm going to the yeshiva to learn now. Why? The Satan will make something that you won't be able to go. Paga Becha Menuval Zeh, Menuval is the Satan, Moshcheu Lebet Amidrash. Confuse him and take him into the yeshiva. Don't let him take you into the soccer game or the basketball game or to the restaurant. Where are you going? I'm going to meet friends. Oh, all of a sudden he goes to the yeshiva. Check yourself and see that it's 100% correct. When you plan to do something and you talk about it, something happens and it doesn't happen. If you speak quiet and just do it, it happens. There's more blessing. Same thing. You, it's better not to talk to people what you have, what you don't have. Why? Because when the people know all your businesses, your investments, what you do, how you make your money, first it's Ainara. Second, the Chazal said, Davar asamui min ha'ayin shora bo abracha. Why? The Torah said that Hashem will bless, the, the Pasuk say, Yevarechecha Hashem bechol mishlach yadecha ubeasamecha. Hashem will bless your wheat, in your storages. Why in my storages? Why not in my house? Not why in, why in my retail store? Why not in my boot? Because over there millions of people give their eye on it. Cannot be blessing. In the storages, that nobody knows where it is, it will multiply and grow and become more and more and more. From here we learn that something that is hidden has blessing. Something that is open, everybody puts his eye on it. Where is the blessing? So Shammai says, always make sure to be nice to every human being. Don't wait until he comes to say hello to you. You went to a wedding, you run to him. How are you, Mr. X? How are you, Mr. Y? Good to see you. What's the problem? Cost you money? No. Rabban Gamliel, who was the president of Israel, is a grand-grandson of King David. He says, Aselech HaRav. Make sure you dedicate one rabbi that you ask him your questions. Don't start jumping from one to another. This is the rabbi that fit me. I like the way he operates. This is going to be my rabbi. With one condition that he knows Torah. You understand? Some rabbis in this generation don't know how to read Rashi. But people made them rabbis. You tell them, rabbi, what Rashi says here, he doesn't know how to read. He's a baba. He collects millions from fools. But he doesn't know what side is Rashi, what side is Tosfot in a Gemara. He may even hold the Gemara upside down. <laughs> You're laughing, but I saw people like this. They walk with a long coat and a sombrero. They come, they have two buttons in the back. Sometimes they come with an assistant that holds their names. And in the end, you ask him a little simple question. And like, it's machloket. It's a contradiction. You know, there's different opinions about Of course, every fool can say a machloket, of course. Rabban Gamliel says, If you have a rabbi, you're not confused. Rabbi, should I do? Should I not do? I'm allowed? Not allowed. In business, I'm doing this. I'm not sure if it's kosher or not. Allowed? Not allowed. Finished. And Shimon Bno, Shimon, the son of Rabban Gamliel, all my life I grew among the Chachamim, the big chief rabbis. They were always around my house. And I did not find better recommendation than this. What? Silence. The more you talk, the worse it gets. Just be quiet. Don't talk. Just talk when, it's, when you must talk, when it's necessary. Pa -pa 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 -pa, all day, I'm saying, how are you? So how are you doing? So what are you doing today? Where are you going? How was the vacation? Who cares? What does it bring to your life? Focus on the, the most important thing. Not the learning is the main thing, the actions is the main thing. Make no mistake, some people think the learning is the, uh, is the main thing. No. The learning was set for us by Hashem to make us do. If you learn about filin, now you know how to get a kosher filin, how to put them, how not to do it. If you learn about mezuzah, now you know how to do mezuzah. You learn about brit milah, you know how to do it. You learn ever so many laws in the Torah. If you don't learn, you don't know what to do. But the actions is the most important thing. Someone who talks a lot, for sure, speaks la jonara. But 
this guy is a great guy, I like him, he's always good, but you know, there's only one problem. The more you talk, for sure you're going to speak Lashon Ara. Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel say, Al shlosha dvarim ha'olam omed. There are three poles that holding the entire world. Three foundations. Aladin, judgment, justice. Ala emet, the truth. Ve'ala shalom, and peace. Peace, the truth, and justice. We finish Baruch Hashem, Perek Rishon of Pirkei Avot. I hope that in ten series, in the ten lectures, we'll be able to, in the Hebrew ones, I finish it in ten lectures. This is uh, the third lecture today. We have seven more to go. I hope to finish it by then. And if not, we'll go another one or two. Bezrat Hashem, I will finish with one minute story. One parliament member from the Congress, I think it was from America, she visited in Israel in, in Simchat Torah, when the Jews danced with the Torah. They took her to one of the streets. You know, in Israel, it's different than here. Here, people dance with the Torah inside the synagogues. But in Israel, it's already a weekday. So they take her to the street, because it's one Yom Tov, one day. Over here, it's two days, Shmini Atzeret. The next day, also Shmini Atzeret. So the second day, they dance inside the synagogue. But in Israel, it's already a weekday. So they come with cars, with, with speakers. They dance in the, in, in, the, in the middle of the cul-de-sacs with car, with, you know, with people and kids, dancing. So they took her to see. So she was asking, what are they dancing with? So they say, with the Torah. So what is it, the Torah, she asked. She said, this is the book of laws of the Jewish nation. So she said, innocently, she said something very interesting. She said, I never believe in my life that I would live to see a nation that dance with the book of the laws of the Constitution. <laughs> Everywhere people hate the law, complain about the law. Nobody ever dance with the laws of the United States or the, the Constitution. Or, over here people dance with the book of law? <laughs> How can it be, she asked. <laughs> you understand, when it's a divine law, there's a reason to dance with this. When it's human law, no. <laughs> Human laws, you know, you know what's the problem with human laws, that you have to upgrade it every generation. Because, you know, things are changing in the world. But divine law applies to all the generation. One Hasidi guy smuggled thousands of bottles of whiskeys to Israel. Thousands, a big container, every bottle is 50 bucks. Thousands of bottles, who knows, maybe million dollar merchandise. The... Yeah, so the black label. <laughs> so the, or blue label, which one is better? Blue, blue, blue okay. I go to Englewood, this Persian guy only drink tap whiskey. For me, it's a poison. <laughs> I feel bad for the cups that they give me in a meal. Here, <laughs> I know each bottle is $200, so every glass they pour is like 20 bucks, you know, and I hate it. <laughs> they don't care, drink, it's smooth. <laughs> for me, it's poison. <laughs> That's okay, so anyway... So the Hasid, they, he got caught. So they bring him to court. Ah, we're going to make a party for the media. He called a religious guy smuggling whiskey. So he stood in front of the judge. He said, in my life, in my life, I never violated the laws of the state of Israel. <laughs> so the judge said, come on, is this a joke or what? We just caught you smuggling thousands of bottles. He said, I never, I never went against the law. Your Honor, here is the law. He opened up a notebook. He said, this is the law. You're not allowed to smuggle to Israel anything from the land and from the ocean. That's the law. I smuggled through the air. <laughs> I did not violate the rules. It says you're not allowed to smuggle from the land or from the ocean. Because when they wrote the law, it was in the time of the Turkish. A hundred years ago, there were no airplanes yet. So they wrote, you're not allowed to smuggle anywhere from the land, you know, with trucks or, or trains, or from the oceans. So they cover all possibilities. They never knew that 20 years later they were going to have airplanes and you can smuggle from the air. So you say, I never smuggled through the land, and I never smuggled through the ocean. I came all the way from the clouds and landed directly in Tel Aviv. The judge said, you're right. Please let him go. <laughs> he went in and they changed the law. This is man-made law. The whole world have laws like this. But we have, Baruch Hashem, the laws of Hashem. Tomorrow at Shavuot, I hope all the men here 
is going to stay to learn Torah all night. It's very important. The ladies don't have to. They can snore very well, as long as they make sure they have a dairy meal in the morning. Why we eat dairy in Shavuot? Because when Moshe came and brought the Torah, they just found out that all the meat they prepare is not glad kosher. They slaughtered them with regular knife. And now there's no time to, to slaughter more animals, to put salt, to take the skin off, to cut the animals to pieces. This is, take, uh, this is a whole day process. The holiday is in an hour or two, so there's no time. So what could they do? They went and took milk and make some omelets, some cheesecakes, some, you know, whatever they made. They had an hour or two to prepare dairy food. 3,320 years every year we eat dairy. But it's still very important. We still have to eat meat and drink wine every Yom Tov, no matter what. One meal dairy, it's good. So we, we, what we do, we stay up all night. We come home in the morning right after the prayer. We make Kiddush. We eat dairy with bread. We eat with bread, with cheese, whatever we eat. And then we do a Birkat Amazon, we go to sleep for a few hours, we get up one, two in the afternoon after we sleep for a few hours, and then we make a regular meal with meat and wine. Because Yom Tov, it's mitzvah from the Torah. Drinking wine, good wine, in Yom Tov, in holidays, and eating meat, even one good bite of meat, it's mitzvah like putting tefillin. It's mitzvah from the Torah. V'samachta b'chagecha, Chazal say, to eat meat, and to drink wine. So if you're vegetarian, what can I do? Please drink some wine. Thank you very much, Levi. Thank you. We'll see you, Bezrat Hashem, next Monday. Call to good.